Next on Max TV, we preview the battle Kodo takes on Margarito, and we have news and notes coming up on the next round. And welcome to the next round. Steve Kim joined as always by the editor in chief of Max Boxing, Doug Fisher. A jam packed show, plenty to talk about. What we begin with the status of Oscar Diaz last Wednesday night in San Antonio after a rough fight with Delvin Rodriguez. He would collapse before the start of round 11 and take him to a local hospital where he was put into a medically induced coma. Doug, as we speak right now, we don't want to say anything that would be out of bounds, but he certainly had some rough moments. All reports are good as of Monday afternoon that it looks like Oscar Diaz is on the road to recovery. And that's, that's great news for the sport of boxing. Um, we're not in a good place, th this sport, and when there are tragedies uh, that happen to young fighters where, you know, where it's, it's on national television, um, you know, it, it's, it, 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 it's not just bad for the, the way the sport is perceived outside of its hardcore fans, but um, these type of tragedies, tragedies, when they are fatal, they have a way of taking uh, the, the spirit from from fans and, and uh, within the industry itself, and um, it, I mean, when I heard the news, the the first thing I thought about was Oscar Diaz's brutal fight against Golden Johnson mm -hmm. in late 2006, and thinking to myself, and actually writing in, in the report, it was on the undercard of the Evander Holyfield Fresa Kendo pay-per-view, a fight that hardly anybody saw, and in many ways, I kind of wish more people saw that. Uh, that, that fight, at least the Diaz-Johnson fight, to know that uh, Diaz had put his body through um, an inhuman beating uh, in the 11 rounds that transpired. Um, that fight made a lot of folks wonder, and I, I know you were one of them, wonder what young Oscar Diaz had left. Um, he only fought a couple of times, maybe three times, in between the Golden Johnson fight and this fight with Delvin Rodriguez, who was a dangerous puncher. One fight was like a one-round no contest. It never really got started. And the other two fights were victories that Diaz scored, but they were over old journeyman opposition. So it, it was still a question mark. We really didn't know what Diaz had left going into this Rodriguez fight. And the dangerous thing about Diaz is he's always going to have his heart, Steve. And uh, he did well early, as he did in the Golden Johnson fight, which I think tends to um, make his trainers uh, or uh, embolden his trainers to allow fights that he's losing to go into the, the, the late rounds. Um, no. They're hoping that he can pull, he can, uh, pull a, a victory out of the jaws of defeat. But that wasn't the case against Golden Johnson, and that certainly wasn't the case against Delvin Rodriguez. Doug, as you mentioned, he was competitive early on. I think he hurt him in the third or fourth round. Yes. But as the round started to mount, you saw the class. You saw the difference in speed and power. But I thought Tommy Brooks in that corner, which is a veteran corner, which was very responsible, this fight was actually less physical than the Golden Johnson fight. This was not a massacre. It's not one of those fights that you look at, and it's obvious to everybody except the corner that the towel should be thrown in. Here I thought you had a fight that was still competitive, but getting away from Oscar Diaz. And Doug, you talk about the residual effects of the Golden Johnson fight. Most of the times when you have these fatal head injuries, it is not just a fight that takes place on that night, but it's subsequent fights prior to that. If you take a look at Benny Kid Perrette, everyone points to the Neil Griffith fight, but it turns out that there was a fight before that with Gene Fulmer, which was unbelievably punishing to Benny Kid Perrette. The bottom line is this, boxing is a very, very dangerous sport. It's a great sport, but there's also a risk involved. Hopefully Oscar Diaz can resume a normal life. We don't want to say that he's recovered, because in certain respects he may never be recovered. But I agree with the state of the game currently and where it is in the marketplace, Boxing does not need a ring death that especially is televised nationally. Yeah, I mean, it, what, what, you know, even as it is, I mean, this is something that has um, dampened the spirits of fight fans. Um, and, and, you know, really we should all, our spirits should be high. Um, you know, we're just five days mm -hmm. away from a, a tremendous welterweight championship bout. Um, all eyes in the sport should be on Miguel Cotto and Margarito and, and the fight that's going to take place this Saturday. But we can't do that. As human yeah. beings, we have to, to, to worry about 
and 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 hope and pray for guys like Oscar Diaz. And you know what? I you know it's I'm not pointing blame at anybody. I'm not pointing blame at at Diaz himself or or Delvin Rodriguez or or the the corners mm -hmm. of, of of either fighter or the 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 officials that were there presiding over that fight because this is um, this is a risk that is inherent in professional boxing and um, as you said it wasn't a particularly brutal contest it yeah. was a contest that was was definitely getting away from Oscar Diaz and like you said Rodriguez was was, was beginning to show his, his class from the middle rounds until the fight was stopped in the 10th round but uh, when you go back and look at the fight and you see the right hands yeah. that are snapping his head back it 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 uh, it's a little bit it's definitely unnerving when you have in mind the brutal ten and a half rounds that he went with Golden Johnson in late 2006. Yeah, Oscar Diaz is a fine young man, a classy individual. You talk to anyone surrounding him, they have nothing but the best things to say. And our prayers are with Oscar Diaz. In lighter fare, it's the fight we've all been waiting for: the battle from the MGM Grand for the WBA welterweight title. Miguel Cotto, undefeated at 32 and zero, faces the Tijuana Tornado Antonio Margarito with a record of 36 and five. Doug, it is finally here. The <laughs> fight that we have waited, seems like forever, but it's only been a couple of months. And this is a fight, you don't need to do a 24 seven, because this fight is about boxing buzz, and it's not about hype. Hype is something that is manufactured and fake, like De La Hoya Mayweather. This is a fight fans fight, that it's a real fight. have some crossover appeal. Doug, I think these are two of the roughest, toughest, and pure fighters in the game today. These are true punishers. These are, are top welterweights who have earned their way to the top of the 147-pound division. Between Margarito and Cotto, I think they've defeated mm. at least 10 top 10 147-pound contenders. These guys have paid the cost to be the boss. And uh, it's, this is the kind of fight where you're absolutely right. You don't need media hype. You don't need, you know, fight fans don't need guys like you and I or commentators on HBO or any other network to tell them this is the fight that you want to see. They already know it. As soon as the fight was signed, as soon as the, the initial kickoff press conference took place, you and I started getting tons of emails from fight fans around the world. And if you did a poll of 100 fight fans, 50 would like Margarito and 50 would like Miguel Cotto. 50 would... Uh, it, envision uh, a, a brutal contest in which uh, the, the winner wins by knockout and another 50 would say no it's going to go down uh, through 12 rounds it's one of these guys is going to win a decision everybody can agree on one thing it's going to be a dramatic compelling exciting fight Doug let's take a look at the style matchups I don't think there's any doubt Miguel Cotto has never faced a true 147 pounder with the size stature and strength of Antonio Margarito but on the flip side, I think there are significant advantages technically and fundamentally when it comes from a pure boxing standpoint. Those advantages go to Miguel Cotto. Well, Miguel Cotto is the Olympian. He was a 2000 Olympian. He was a, a much ballyhooed uh, Puerto Rican, Caribbean area amateur fighter, Steve. I mean, this is the guy who was in against the best fighters from Cuba, uh, from uh, Eastern Europe, and, and from the United States when he was still a teenager and he turned pro uh, under the banner of, of top-ranked boxing promotions and they know how to move any fighter but particularly a talented and dedicated fighter like Miguel Cotto. I think what makes Miguel Cotto special is, is not his heavy hand, Steve, um, and it, it's, it's part of it is his, his spirit, the, the fact that he's a guy who you can hurt and he's gonna rally back. He's gonna keep his composure and rally back and stop the guys who are on the verge of stopping him. But I think it's his intelligence yeah. and his willingness to continue to improve. And we've seen that at, ever since he stepped up from 140 pounds to the welterweight division. Every major fight of his was a test. I think it was a test to fight an undefeated Carlos Quintana, a crafty yeah. counterpuncher uh, who was undefeated at the time in your, his first fight at welterweight. It was a test to take on Zab Judah a guy who had phenomenal speed and power and uh, most expected to test the chin yeah. of Miguel Cotto uh, at, at welterweight. He passed those two tests and, and then he went to his first really big test, Shane Mosley, a guy who has better experience, perhaps a, a more versatile fighter than, than Cotto, 
and, and definitely athletically better despite being nine years older. Miguel Cotto passed that test and showed the kind of versatility that many people, myself included, think, uh, believe he's going to have to re rely on to beat the Tijuana Tornado. Yeah, Miguel Cotto is almost dispassionate. He's cold and he's calculating. He's almost like the Terminator, so he's a cyborg from Caguas, but I don't <laughs> think he's ever faced the type of challenges he's going to get from the Tijuana Tornado. Definitely. Not that Margarito is technically sound, but what he's going to bring is steady pressure and the ability to catch and to pitch I think Miguel Cotto is going to win the early rounds by boxing. I think everything will be off the jab. They're going to try to move and make Margarito reset his feet and give him angles. I think the early rounds will be dictated by Miguel Cotto, and I think the onus will be on Antonio Margarito not to get caught cold early and yet not to fall too far behind in the late the championship rounds, and they'll apply the steady pressure. If there's one thing Margarito needs to do, in my opinion, I think he needs to work off of a jab and beyond that. He has got the best lead left uppercut of any right-handed fighter I've seen, perhaps since Marco Antonio Barrera. If you look at Miguel Cotto, the way he places his hands, his elbows come yeah. out. The five right. hole, as they say in hockey, is open. So that's going to be a very interesting chess match within a brutal bloodbath. I think this is going to be what the best of what boxing has to offer. Doug. You know who I'm going to pick. There's no other way I can go about it. As president of the Tijuana Tornado, yes, to. I am going to take Antonio Margarito by late knockout. Really? A late stoppage? Mm. Wow. You know, I, nothing would surprise me. Um, a decision victory for either fighter would not surprise me. Um, I can see Miguel Cotto outpointing yeah. Margarito. He's the better technician. He's the more versatile fighter. But I can also see Margarito outpointing Cotto because of his superior work mm. rate, Steve. I can just see him out-hustle the Cogless mm. Crusher. Um, I can see either guy uh, being worn down. Um, however, the fact that Margarito has never been stopped and there's no questions about his chin mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that uh, Cotto, despite having um, a shaky chin in, at points in his past career, m mostly at 140 pounds, he's undefeated. He finds a way to survive, and he finds a way to win through the rough spots. I think we're going to get a 12-round fight. Within 12 rounds, I think Miguel Cotto's class will show he will win a slight majority of those rounds. I like the man from Caguas, Puerto Rico, by uh, seven, seven rounds to five margin, Steve, 115, 113. It's, it's really that kind of fight. The bottom line, I think he will fight when he has to. He will box when he needs to. He will stand and trade when it suits him. He will stick and move yeah. when it suits him. It's really going to come down to that versatility. But I agree with you 100%. This is yet another test for young Miguel Cotto. Uh, Margarito is bigger, stronger, more durable, more active, and I think he has a stronger will to win than anybody that Cotto has faced in his previous 32 encounters. Uh, Doug, here's the thing. If Miguel Cotto beats Antonio Margarito, I think you make a strong argument that he's number two pound for pound behind Manny Pacquiao. And yes, I would leapfrog him over Joe Calzaghe. I think if there's ever a fight where fighters should be allowed to wear a rib protector or a flak jacket, <laughs> I think it's this one because I think both guys are going to make a concerted effort to dig body shots, especially with the left hook on the inside. What I find interesting about this fight is that Antonio Margarito is the taller guy, he's a little bit leaner with the superior reach, but I actually think he needs to be on the mid-range and on the inside. I actually think despite being the shorter, stockier guy, if there's a guy that's going to out-jab the other guy, I think it's going to be Miguel Cotto. I really believe the way Antonio Margarito wins is by getting inside the jab and not taking too much punishment while he closes the gap. That is the question, because Margarito does leave openings defensively. However, if you take a look at the guys that have beaten him, guys like Daniel Santos and Paul Williams in recent years, those were southpaws that were a little bit that bigger. That were taller right. than Margarita. So that's Tall, rangy lefties. Right. The, the man from Caguas, Puerto Rico, five foot seven, if that, and he's an orthodox fighter. So, yeah, this is, uh, if, if Miguel Cotto can beat Antonio Margarita, in, in, beat Antonio Margarito by any means, whether it's it's by boxing or by slugging, uh, it will be an amazing feat because we've never seen a guy that short and compact who is an orthodox fighter who stands and trades as much as Cotto does yeah. defeat Antonio Margarito. It's always been 
tall, lanky, rangy, southpaw boxers. Mm -hmm. Guys who can either, like Paul Williams, match or even surpass Margarito in terms of work rate, or guys who can box effectively from the outside like Daniel Santos. I, I think Cotto has to do that, but you have to imagine that it's going to be more difficult for a guy with short arms who's five foot seven to pull that off against Margarito than somebody who's six foot one and as rangy as Daniel Santos. Uh, Doug, we're not going to even talk about the undercard because, quite frankly, it's not worth our breath. But <laughs> I don't know if this fight will be as good as the third encounter between Rafael Marquez and Israel Vasquez. Kind of hard to imagine. But. but yeah. Th that's the last time I've had this type of feeling leading into a fight. Though. Yeah, and we're not alone. And I know you're getting the emails. I've gotten emails from people from, uh, from, from Europe, uh, from, from Australia, from Canada, from all across the United States. They are flying into Vegas. They are driving there from different parts of the country. And everybody's excited. I mean, I, Steve, we, we're going to save money on the amount of alcohol we drink because there's a guys. lot of people who want to buy us drinks and, 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 and that's just fine because really they want to sit down with like-minded individuals, people who appreciate boxing, people who love the sport, and people who love to see an excellent fight. And I agree with you, I, I doubt it's going to surpass that rubber match between Israel Vasquez and Rafael Marquez, but you know what Steve, even if there's some boxing mixed in with the yeah. slugging, it's going to be compelling because of the physical strength, because of the punching power yeah. that both guys possess, and because of their will to win. These guys are winners. Losing is not an option. When you get fighters like that, guys who are in their athletic primes, men who are at their peak in their professional boxing careers, we're going to get a great fight. And you know what? We're not going to be alone in watching this fight live or on TV. Cotto Margarito battle. This Saturday from the MGM Grand, we come back, we take a look at News and Notes. And we're back on the next round. Steve Kim, Doug Fisher talking boxing. Round number two, we begin. It's old versus new. October 18th from Atlantic City, New Jersey. Kelly Pavlik will take on the executioner, Bernard Hopkins. Doug, the executioner shall not die. We will not <laughs> hear the last of the executioner song. But, Doug, I don't think it's a good fight. I think everyone involved has admitted as much. They say it's not their first choice. But here's the thing. Who else is there for Kelly Pavlik to face right now? And that's the thing I ask people that are so hard on this matchup. The bottom line is this. Arthur Abraham is not available at this current time. Right. Felix Sturm, you are not getting out of Germany. So when it's all said and done, Hopkins, who some people believe beat Joe Calzaghe, Ring Magazine still has him in the top five pound for pound. Yeah. I think is still a more viable option than Marco Antonio Rubio and Joe Green and guys of that ilk. Yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of like, you know, um, a, a, a young, strong, undefeated champion um, becomes recognized as, as the man in a division, uh, it, but he, he's still making his name and he takes on, like Mike Tyson did back in 1988. A Larry Holmes, right? Or as uh, Evander Holyfield did in 1990, a George Foreman. Yeah. It's like, you know what? At the end of the at, at the end of the day, Bernard Hopkins is more of a name than John Duddy or Alan Green or whoever else was was talked and about. Doug, at uh, 170, yeah. where this is the fight, uh, it's going to be at Winky Rate, which is really not super middleweight. It's not <laughs> light heavyweight. I think he it's, does, a, it's a hard he fight does for, for Pavlik. Has some advantages yeah. because number one, Bernard Hopkins is more acclimated to the weight. Pavlik can still make 160. And defensively, Bernard Hopkins is not exciting. But from that perspective of defense, he could still neutralize a guy. He could take away your best weapon. I don't see. And he still has knockout. legs. He still does have legs. And that's legs. one thing uh, I, I think. I, I think just a little bit of lateral movement. You know, not standing around enabled Jermaine Taylor not only to go the distance with Pavlik this past February, but make that a very close fight. Yeah. And I, I tell you what, Bernard Hopkins, he, the guy's amazing. Um, he's, he's, I think he's genetically gifted, but he's also taken care of his body for decades. So he's a very well-preserved 43 or 44-year-old prize fighter in there. I think his legs are every bit as fresh as Jermaine Taylor's, and he moves about that ring with more purpose. This guy is a true ring general. He knows how to neutralize an offensive fighter. And yes, Kelly Pavlik, 
He's a volume puncher. He's a power puncher. It all comes in straight lines, Steve. If you step yeah. off the tracks, if you said that that runaway train, it's not going to hurt you. Well, so it'll be interesting to see how Pavlik handles well, the footwork, the lateral movement, and the overall caginess of Bernard Hopkins. Doug, I like Pavlik because of youth and the activity, because while Bernard Hopkins has legs, he simply cannot pull the trigger as much anymore, or nearly as much as he used to, mm, even, let's say, true. three, four years ago. No, you're right. But here's how Bernard Hopkins is going to try to win the fight. Number one, he's going to try to take him in the deep waters. He's going to try to slow the pace. But he's going to mug him on the inside. Right, and three or four times around, he will try to lay traps and run Pavlik in to, to straight right, hands. Straight right yeah. hands and Lunging, maybe yeah. test the chin of Kelly Pavlik at 170. Now, the margin for error is not very large at that point, but Bernard Hopkins is a master of keeping fights close and then complaining like hell after he loses decision. <laughs> yeah. That's what I think happens. Taking a look at the fight review, FSN Wednesday Night Fights, it was Best Bam, another show, James Tony with a TKO in three, Asim Rockman, and then on Friday Night Fights, Jurikis Gamboa with a TKO in one over the late replacement Al Seeger, then on Telefutura, Thomas Pancho Villa with a TKO in four over Gilberto Sanchez Leon. Doug, uh, after what we just talked about in the first segment with the status of Oscar Diaz and the grueling fight he went through and his life being in peril, I don't want to call Hassan Rahman a coward or anything else people have written into us. It right. takes a lot of courage to go into that ring. However, once you sign on the dotted line, as Teddy Atlas likes to say, there's a pact, there's a covenant, there's an understanding that you make when you are going to perform as a professional prize fighter and you get paid that money, you have a certain responsibility. I'm going to take his word for it. Yes, the cut affected him with the blood coming into his eye, but I will say this, Doug. In my opinion, if Cotto or Margarito get that cut at the same time on Saturday night, there's no way guess they're, what? On they're, they're going yeah. on. There's no way they're going to stay on their stool. No, but you know what? Margarito and, and Miguel Cotto are, are young fighters who are on their way up. Hassan Rockman uh, has already been recognized as the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. Um, his time uh, in the spotlight took place seven years ago, Steve. <laughs> and he's really been milking it ever uh, since. Uh, I mean, he's managed to, to grab himself a, a, a version of the heavyweight title, the WBC belt, since then. Um, but the guy has, um, he's 35 years old. He's, 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 he's won the world title. He's made his money. He's got a big family. He's not a dumb guy. I, I think at this stage of his career, he's not willing to go out there and make the ultimate sacrifice the way we know you know, young Oscar Diaz was, and the way we know that, that both Cotto and Margarito will this Saturday. I'm not going to call him a, a, a gutless quitter because I've seen Hassan Rockman fight with another head right. going on uh, on his head. Um, I, I've seen him hurt really bad against a prime David Tua uh, with a, a late punch, a punch that happened Corey after the bell, Sanders. and he still came out for that fight against Corey Sanders. He, Sanders, he was buzzed repeatedly and rallied to win that fight by stoppage. So this is a guy who does have heart, he has guts, but those days are years ago, Steve. Uh, I think he's just reached that point in his career where when the going gets tough, he sits down. <laughs> uh, I, from, from the letter of the law, according to the rules of the ABC and the California State Athletic Commission, when a fight is stopped by someone in the commission because of an accidental clash of heads, it should be ruled a no contest. If it hasn't gone four rounds. Right. After four rounds, you go to the scorecard. Now, I yeah. think, to me, the California State Athletic Commission used a little bit of common sense. I think their belief was, you can't have a guy who made a calculated decision to say, you know what, I'm in the third round, James Tony's starting to find his groove, right. he's timing my right hand, and I'm That's getting countered. That's what it looked like from these eyes, yeah. And I really believe they said, we cannot reward a guy for bailing out on his own trap door. And I agree with that. Not saying they're not going to overturn it. Yeah. I believe there's going to be a protest from Hassan Rockman. And I think they camp. have an argument. Right. But now James Tony, James Tony to me, the shame is for the last four or five years, he's wasted a lot of time. I saw some things. He's as good as he's going to be. And I like the fact he still says, I need to lose 10 to 12 pounds. Whether that's going to happen or not, that's up to him, not me. But I still think he could beat a certain level of heavyweight but you just wonder, as you see him live and he can't pull the trigger quite as fast right. as he once did, did he simply squander too much time? Well, yeah. But, I mean, listen, this guy shouldn't be a heavyweight anyways. Yeah. I'm sorry. I mean, really, cruiserweight, when the cruiserweight limit was 190, I thought that was perfect for yeah. him. It wasn't like he had to, to dehydrate himself to make weight. 
It wasn't too big to where he's, he, he would have yeah. to eventually fight guys, you know, who have bone breaking power, guys who are six foot six with, you know, 95 inch wing, uh, wingspans. Um, it, it's amazing that he was able to do what he did at heavyweight considering the lifestyle that he had. He overindulged in everything. The only thing he didn't overindulge in, Steve, was training. Now, the guy's actually doing four miles on a treadmill. We have documented yes. evidence of this. I didn't he's, believe it till I saw it. No, he really does, you know, and, and now people say, well, he still has B cups and he still has a gut. Well, you know what, a lot of that is just excess skin. This is a guy who would blow up to 300 pounds yeah. in between fights and he was fighting at like in the high 230s. Um, I think it was a good sign that he, 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 took this, he took this rematch seriously. He put in the work, not just with road work and, and miles on the treadmill and ab work and all that good stuff, but with good quality hard sparring with, with, with quality fighters. That's a good sign. Um, he's never going to be an Adonis, folks. That, that, that belly and those B cups, that's just excess skin. But underneath there, there is muscle. He does have enough of his legs left. There are enough reflexes, Steve, where I think that he can beat um, a number of top well, 10 heavyweight yeah. contenders. I don't know if he can beat a Vladimir Klitschko, particularly if Klitschko is fighting a safety first fight. It's just a matter of well, physics. But physics. One guy's this tall, you know the other what? guy's this tall. But Doug, you talk. know what? Even, even though he turns 40 mm -hmm. next month, even at age 40, I mean, he's kind of like Bernard Hopkins. He's one of these special guys, and he's even more special than Bernard because unlike Bernard, he didn't take care of himself. Um, I think he's still a factor in well, the heavyweight division, the, I have to be honest with you. Underneath all that flesh right here beats a real fighter, and here beats a boxing glove, as they once said about Marvin Hagler and talking to Dan Goosen. The goal is, regardless of what happens with that Rockman decision, whether it's overturned or not, Dan Goosen wants to get James Tony right back into the gym and right back into a real fight within two or three months. And I think smart. that's the way to go. That's smart. Doug, your Kaikis Gamboa, I think, made the statement we wanted him to make against Darling Jimenez. Yeah. But let's keep this in perspective. Al Seeger was brought in, and I think whoever allowed Al Seeger to take this fight under these circumstances needs to be looked at. I thought that was a mismatch going in, and it yeah, was. Yeah, it really was. And, and to Gamboa's credit, he took care of business. Business. He's supposed to be a blue uh, blue chip prospect. He's supposed to be a, a future champion within three or four fights, Steve. This is a guy who had over 300 amateur fights. He was a world amateur champion. He was a Pan American Games champion. He was an Olympic champion. So why is he fighting some kid from Savannah, Georgia? Why is he fighting a kid who every time he stepped up in competition, He's either been outclassed or brutally well, beaten as he was he, against Daniel Ponce de Leon. That Ponce de Leon fight, I think, irrevocably changed the arc of his career. Yeah. In fairness to Gamboa, this was a late replacement. Yes, yeah. Uh, but but I'll tell you what, he took care of business. Yes. And that right hand, I mean, you know what? Al Seeger was trying to tie him up on the inside. He had a hold of his right hand, and Gamboa just swatted him a couple times, yeah. pawing with his left. As soon as Seeger let go of that right hand, it turned into a cross that I don't think traveled more than seven inches. It was like the kid let go, bam! And that was a true one-punch knockout, absolutely neurologically scrambled. His brain and body shut off. He kind of collapsed yeah. in himself and then fell back and hit the back of his head on his canvas. This kid should not go anywhere near a gym in 45 days. Uh, I think Gambo is an impressive physical specimen. He's got a tool shed that would make the Home Depot blush. However, <laughs> I want to see what happens when he gets in with a good, solid guy that could jab him from the outside and make him think about some things. I think Gambo is very gifted, but again, he's still a prospect even with that amateur pedigree. Taking a look at that fight preview, Wednesday night fight. See you at the crossroads. Jeff Lacey takes on Epi Mendoza. Friday Night Fights, Buddy McGirt Jr. takes on Raymond Joval. And then on Telefutura, Jesus Soto Cross takes on David Estrada. Doug, some interesting fights here. I tell you what, I'm going to go with the slight, mild upset special. I think Epi Mendoza beats Left Hook Lacey. Really? Yes, I do. Why? I mean, Mendoza, he's always dangerous. He's one of those Colombian yeah. punchers. But a puncher is all he is, Steve. I, I guess you could say the same well, thing about Lacey. Lacey. <laughs> but uh, in the past, Lacey has shown to have pretty solid whiskers. I'm not, I'm not yeah. saying he's... Jake LaMotta in there, but uh, the, the guy can take some punishment, and Mendoza is just so wild. Yeah. And here's the thing about Mendoza. 
You never know what kind of shape this guy well, is. That's the come danger. Into. He's a wild card. There's yeah, no doubt. I don't know card. how much Jeff Lacey Not really much. wants to fight. Now <laughs> right. we talk about irrevocably changing a career. Uh, I don't know if it's quite as bad as Fernando Vargas post Felix Trinidad, but Jeff Lacey post Joe Calzaghe is not the same guy we saw in 2002, I'll three, tell you the four, difference five. between Lacey and, and Fernando Vargas. Vargas had the fight beat out of him yeah. physically. It yeah. was more of a, of a physical deterioration post-Trinidad. Lacey, although he did take a drubbing, I think it's less physical and it's more psychological. Well, he didn't face Trinidad. Trinidad was right. an unbelievable puncher at 154, while Calzaghe is more of a slap, slap hitter. Yeah. But here's what but I he, think. I he, think he, Mendoza he him, does have some physical advantages. Number one, he's taller, he's got a better reach. Yeah. And a guy that could jab from the outside and set up his punches off the stick they will always give Jeff Lacey trouble. But this goes does back Mendoza to the fight like well, that? Well, no, he doesn't. doesn't but he, isn't but he kind of like this? He does. But you know what? <laughs> Jeff Lacey is like one of those punchers who likes a one-way street. Oh, yeah. He's much better pitching than pitching and catching. I think he's a very dangerous Epi. fight. I'll give this for Epi Mendoza. He won't be intimidated. No. He's not going to be like, ooh, left hook Lacey. Yeah. He's, he is somebody who believes in himself and believes in his power, and sometimes that's half the battle. Uh, Doug, Jesus Soto Cross against David Estrada is a very, very good fight. It's a poor man's Margarito Cotto. Yeah, if Soto Cross <laughs> has trained well, and I think he has, and he has not been beat out of the gym by Antonio Margarito sparring for this particular camp, I think he's a little bit too big. I think he's a little bit too fresh for the always tough David Estrada. I don't know who's going to win this fight. I'm going to enjoy it's a tough watching fight. it. It's a tough uh, one. We're going to be there at the yes, Hard Rock, we right? Will. We'll be ringside for that. I'll be doing the. Uh, the, the deadline story for this fight, and uh, it's interesting because Soto Carras is a Margarito sparring partner, and he trains out of that team Margarito camp. His trainer is, is Javier Capetillo. David Estrada has just made the move to team Evangelista Cotto. Mm. He's been training in Puerto Rico with Miguel Cotto. I don't know if they've done any sparring or whatever, but uh, it will be interesting to see what Evangelista does with David Estrada's style. David Estrada, always a strong, willing warrior in there. Sometimes he catches a little bit too much. Uh, it's, there's a question mark uh, as to what's left in Estrada's tank after late stoppages against both Kermit Centron and Andre mm -hmm. Berto. If he does have his legs uh, under him, and if Evangelista, to get him to, to actually fire a jab before wading in there and exchanging punches, we have a very interesting contest. Uh, I'm going to give a, a slight edge to Soto Carras. I think the style of uh, David Estrada will bring the best out of him. Soto yeah. Carras is a guy who kind of needs you to force him to fight sometimes. But once he starts fighting, uh, and he has pretty good stamina and a very good chin, I think he can outwork Estrada down the stretch. If the same Soto Carras that showed up against Chris Smith shows up Friday night, he He'll will lose. not beat David <laughs> yeah, Estrada. True. And we wrap things up a pair of tidbits here. September 27th, this fight has moved from October 11th, and now it is on HBO. Shane Mosley will take on Ricardo Mayorga, and Doug, they are in talks. It's Lefty Grove against Steve Carlton in the form of Paul Williams and Winky Wright. Doug, the best thing I could say about Mosley Mayorga now is we don't that have to it's, pay it's not 49 dollars right, right, right. We don't have to still show the same fight, though, isn't it? It's, the same, it's still a fight that no one really asked for. It's still a fight that's coming four or five years too late. Um, but it's a fight. It's two offensive-minded guys. I think Shane Mosley absolutely beats the dog crap out of Mayorga. And some people will enjoy watching that, Steve. Mayorga gets on a lot of people's nerves. But at least the fight is where it should be on HBO Championship Boxing no, and know, not pay-per-view. Doug, you'll say this. Take away the Vargas fight last uh, Thanksgiving weekend, and I think Mayorga has been beaten more than pinatas in East L.A. because <laughs> yep. candy does not fall out. Um, <laughs> the only chance I think Mayorga has is really being in great shape, surviving the early storm, and hoping that Shane Mosley has turned the corner. Yeah. And you never know, because he is 36, 37 yeah, years you're more, old. Yeah, he, he, he's, he's better off relying on Shane turning the corner right. and, and then showing up in shape, because that ain't happening. Uh, if that's his only chance, he has no chance. Paul Williams, Winky Wright, this fight is being negotiated. Doug, do you see a scenario where that fight is actually entertaining? Wow. Because I think Wright is invited, but Paul Williams will take the initiative. He throws. And when somebody presses Winky Wright offensively the way Shane Mosley did, and the way Jermaine Taylor did, Winky Wright is not that bad of a fighter to watch. As long as you can, you can press him and you can switch gears and you can throw a high volume of punches. I mean, Felix Trinidad is an offensive fighter, 
but he's kind of method methodical and yeah. one-dimensional, and that fight was mind-numbingly boring. But against a, a dynamic offensive fighter like Shane Mosley in their first fight, and uh, Jermaine Taylor in that fight with Winky Wright, Winky Doug, made for pretty decent fights. Doug, I mean, not great fights, but pretty decent fights. Doug, so. I tell you what, if they don't make this fight for Paul Williams, and there's nothing on the horizon for him except that obligatory mandatory against a guy by the name of Michael Jennings, then they I, screwed up by not taking the Pavlik fight. Let me tell you fight. something, no those representatives that. of Paul Williams, I think what they did to this young man who was willing to take a pretty good payday against some would say insurmountable odds by moving up to a big strong middleweight and you've never really fought as a full-fledged junior middleweight right. to take on Pavlik yet here you go from taking a payday well over a million dollars and the Winky Wright fight I've heard is either way okay then you have nothing that is almost unconscionable and here's my question me. what weight class does the Paul Williams Winky Wright fight take place I at? think it would have to take place at 160 because I think Winky Wright so he's gonna go up to 160 anyways if you're gonna fight at middleweight for the first time why not do it against the undefeated undisputed middleweight champion of you the world why? why fight Winky well, Wright no no well because number one thing, and Winky Wright stylistically is more difficult than Pat he is but physically if you lose to Winky Wright, you know you're not going to get put through the same type of punishing meat grinder right. that Pavlik is. Right. So in that's that just, respect, that's, 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 in that's, that respect, that's you know that's that's a um, that's a calculated move that they're taking at, with with Winky Wright. They could get outboxed by Winky Wright. They're not going to get punished to the extent where. Paul Williams loses years yeah. off of his boxing career. But that's if they make, that's, yeah. if they make the fight, then you could say, okay, that's a second place prize. But if I hear any of them, Dan Goose and Al Heyman say, we're going to wait around for Cotto Margarito. Guess what? I've talked to the Bob Arum. He <laughs> does not want to do business with them right now. They are never going to get Miguel Cotto. And even if Margarito wins, I think as of right now, just talking to Bob yesterday, he is very, very reticent in dealing with Al Heyman. So that could be an impediment in Paul Williams Let me ask making big money at 47. Let me ask, so, so Aram is that upset with the way the, the, the Let, people representing Paul Williams handled the, the Pavlik negotiation? He didn't say he would just guarantee that they wouldn't get the winner of Cotto Margarito. Bob Aram says, I guarantee F and T it. Wow. So a guarantee F and T trumps <laughs> a regular guarantee. Yes, that, that's true. Yes. So then let me ask you this follow-up question. Where does the winner of Cotto Margarito go. Oh, there's, I no doubt, there's no if doubt. If Margarito won, a great fight is a rematch with well, Paul Williams. That lets us know truly who the undisputed champion is at, at welterweight. Bob Arum's exact words were basically, well, if Mosley beats Mayorga, we can go there. Okay. And if my guy Claudie beats Judah, then we could do that fight. Okay. But there's guy, but those guys like Heyman and Goo. There's no way they're dead to me. And that's uh, and, and that, that's, that's, and that's not whether right. it's whether it's Cotto or Margarito who wins. If Cotto wins, Bob would be willing to put Cotto in with Josh Clotty. If he if, can't make a or, De La Hoya fight. Yes. Right, right. So which I, I think with, yeah. if, if Cotto wins, I think the first place he goes is is, is De La Hoya. Right. They try to make that fight. But I think right yeah. now there, there's some bad blood that's been simmering with Bob and the HBO. So what else? Is boxing so what, yeah. so what else is so new? So what else is new? But anyway, but, uh, Doug, I cannot wait. We're actually going up on a Thursday. Yes. Because for the big ones, we don't go Wednesday. We go Thursday. That's right. And uh, if, if you've ever wanted to, to chew the fat or have a drink with a dynamic duo, there's basically three places you'll find us. There's yes. Fat Tuesdays yes. downstairs near the self-parking yes. at, at right. the Indian brand. One. There's the uh, Rainforest Cafe. That's where we eat. That's, that's where we eat. Then we have the Rouge. And then, and then there's, uh, I think there's, there's two lounges there's by the, the elevators. There's the Rouge. The Rouge. And what's the, it used to be the Betty Boop Lounge. It used lounge. to be the Betty Boop, but it's right by it's the elevators. Now. Right. It's the lounge by the elevators. And maybe the sports book, yeah. you don't see us there. But basically, we're going between uh, Fat Tuesdays yeah. and those lounges. <laughs> so you'll see us walking across the lobby or just kind of, we don't actually sit down yeah. in the lounge. Yeah. We actually stand around outside of it. Yeah. We so, loiter. Yeah, we loiter. No <laughs> we're not playing the slot machines. We just sit there yeah. and drink and, and, and look at people. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And, so, and you know what? I think there's going to be people there. It's been a long time since there's been a big fight buzz in Sin City. I think we're going to have it. And, and the great thing is, it's going to be a hardcore fight fan, a Puerto Rican and Mexico fight fan buzz leading into this great welterweight matchup. So there you have it on behalf of Doug Fisher and the rest of Max Boxing. Till the next round, goodbye, everybody.